Welcome to Tappy Vegas, brought to you by Better and Green. We are back to break down UFC 309, John Jones versus Stipe. We went up five units last week, did very well. Um, Bobby, we didn't think this fight was going to happen, but it looks like it's here. It looks like it's going to happen. Uh, John Bone Jones is back, dude. Can't say I'm excited, but he is. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a lot of guys, a lot of big names are going to be fighting on this New York card. Uh, let's just get straight into it. We have seven fights for you guys today to break down to get win you guys some money. Uh, Bobby, why don't you take this first one away, man? Basil Hafez versus Oban Elliott. This is a banger to kick things off. Uh, both two young, promising prospects here that we're uh, dealing with. So Hafez is a guy that really impressed me because Hafez, if you remember in his UFC debut last July, probably drew one of the toughest opponents you can draw uh it was short notice but nonetheless he stepped up and he went up against jack della maddalena and took it to a split decision a lot of people kind of go back and forth on who won that fight it was primarily a grappling affair hafez actually was able to pretty much just take down jdm at will and just kind of control him for the majority of some of those rounds because jdm for some reason was doing his best Dustin Poirier impression, just jumping a guillotine that he never had locked up and just finding himself in bottom position for a good chunk of some th uh, of the three rounds. So that was kind of the writing on the wall where I was like, man, JDM's going to have trouble with Gilbert Burns. And uh, the crazy thing is, though, Hafez had, had like an easier time, maybe because JDM wasn't prepared for that from Hafez, but Hafez got JDM down a lot easier than Burns did. Burns had some difficulty. Hafez did not. Once again, could have been the short notice uh, and, you know, expecting something different, not having much tape on the guy to prepare for, as opposed to Burns with all the tape that's already out there on him, that type of thing. But I was really impressed in his debut to be dealt that hand of, you know, having to fight Jack Della Maddalena, who by that time was already rising up the rankings of Walter Waite, come in, take it to a very close split decision, cruise through Mickey Gall. So this is his third fight in the UFC. And I really am confused by the odds because I'm also a big Oban Elliott guy. I've been a fan of him since I watched him on the Contender Series last August, thought he had promising, exciting fight style, was going to be able to make some noise in the division and kind of carve out a name for himself. But, I mean, this is where watching tape and kind of looking into things a little deeper than the box scores comes into play because, yes, he beat Val Woodburn by unanimous decision, Preston Parsons by unanimous decision. This is also his third UFC fight now. Oman Elliott really kind of struggled with those guys in moments, and I don't remember if it was the Parsons fight or the Woodburn fight. I want to say it was the Woodburn fight where I was watching it, and I was like, he's probably going to win, but this is not encouraging for his future trajectory and his development to be struggling this hard this early on with guys who he's matched up pretty fairly with right now. He's not getting gimme fights. It's it's actually surprisingly good matchmaking by the, by the UFC when he fought both of these guys at the time he fought them. And, yeah, it was Val Woodburn because I was like, okay, Val Woodburn, his second fight was against Oban Elliott got absolutely destroyed by Bo Nickel in round one on short notice, stepping in to fight Bo Nickel and everything. Obviously, with how Nichols looked, that's no shame on Val Woodburn. But nonetheless, for a guy who is like a landscaper and everything, to be able to take somebody like Oban Elliott to the scorecards and actually have some moments where he was kind of rocking Oban Elliott and everything, that's very concerning. So it's, it's just very – I, I can't see or understand based off watching the tape and not just the box scores, how or why Hafez is such a dog in this because Hafez is a plus 240, Oban's a minus 298. And just, I've got, if he can pass the Hafez test, I'll have a lot more faith and confidence in him. But right now, I've got to, I can't pass up on the Hafez money line at plus 240 for this because, yeah, Hafez is just already went up against JDM one of the best prospects in that division along with Shavkat took him to a very close split decision and Oban Elliott has won both of his fights and they've been by unanimous decision, but he's just has looked very concerning. And unless he's going to show uh, showcase a new facet to his game and come out there and look a lot sharper and everything, I think this is where we're going to start to see Oban Elliott kind of start to decline and not really be able to match up with the UFC, uh, with the UFC track right now. 
Uh, I don't necessarily think he's going to get cut or wash out anytime soon, but this is a very hard test for him to be put up against and for him to be such a huge favorite in his third UFC fight going up against a guy who Mickey Gall's on this card too, and I get he's a, he's a bit of a meme, but Mickey Gall's a lot tougher opponent than anybody Oban Elliott's faced so far. And for that reason, I, I've got to roll Hafez. I think this has upset written all over it and a reasonable upset to expect at that. What do you think? I think you broke that down. Excellent, Bobby. I'm going to try to, to speed these episodes up. I'll try to leave more of that, like the fighting aspect to you, and I'll try to take on the more like the Vegas money side. Uh, that way we can kind of thunder and lightning this. So what I'm looking at is when I made these graphics not even an hour ago to use for this show, right now you're seeing plus 230. It's already moved up another 10 points. <clears throat> up to plus 240 now. Uh, it looked like earlier, Hafez was seeing 35% of the bets, 29% of the money. That had him at <coughs> plus 136. Um, and then Oban Elliott had 65% of the bets, 71% of the money. So now what, what, what I'm seeing is that Elliott went from 65% of the bets all the way up to 78%. So you think, okay, a whole bunch more bets are coming on Oban. That means money's pouring in on him. And that's why Hafez keeps... His numbers keep going up. That's actually not the case. We're seeing some reverse line movement here because he went up to 78%, but he dropped from 71% of the bets all the way down to 55% of the bets. So now we're seeing about 23% of sharp money coming in on Hafez at the plus 230. Now at plus 240, I, I'm just seeing a lot of sharp money come pouring in on Hafez, which once again, they might be playing that number. But also, I think they're playing that number because of how well he did against JDM. So I'm going to be on the same side as you, Bobby, for this one. Uh, I'm going to take Hafez. This is a weird line. So sometimes with the reverse line movement, you want to stay away. But I just think with Hafez, with how good he looked, I think he can get this one done, especially at the plus 230. You know, if he doesn't win, okay. But this is one of those that if you're going to go with a 2-1 to one dog, over two to one dog, then, you know, go for the win. I think like sometimes you can be crazy. We'll talk about it later. You can go for a plus 600 plus 750. It's like, okay, it's just a donation to Vegas. Most of the time when you're doing those bets, this is one where it feels like we can, we can catch them a little bit. There we go, man. Beautiful. Let's talk about the second fight. One of my favorite fighters of all time. That's Chris Weidman versus Eric, I believe. Is it? Yes, Eric Anders. Yeah, Eric. He spells it so weird, it just throws me off. Um, Chris Weidman, like I said, one of my favorite guys. American wrestler. Right now, he is the underdog. Both are at minus money, though. Chris Weidman at minus 102. Anders or Anders at the minus 118. So I'm going to go with Weidman here. He's. You know, the American guy in New York on a, like, end-of-the-year pay-per-view. I feel like the UFC kind of set him up here to be like, look, like, this, we're going to give you this fight. It's a fight that you can win. And you go out on top. Looking at the money side, let's see, where is he at? Weidman, 55% of the bets, but 72% of the money. So we're seeing some sharp money coming in on Weidman here, too. Um, at the minus 102, the Vegas side would be Eric here, but I just think that the UFC set Weidman up in a good spot here to get a win right off into the sunset and kind of put the ball in his court before they're like, okay, dude, like no more, no more gimmies for you. It's time to go. What do you think, Bobby? I mean, Weidman's 40. This one's tough because, yeah, this is another example of some good matchmaking here. Uh, both very similar. Eric Anders, 16 and 8. Uh, Weidman, 16 and 7, I believe their records are. And I just, it's tough because Weidman is one of those legends of the sport. And you want him, like you were saying, yeah, Weidman, 16 and 7. Anders, 16 and 8. Similar in age, similar wear and tear, all that fun stuff. But you would think they're setting Weidman up to go out on a high note, but I don't know. Eric Anders. Uh, football linebacker for University of Alabama, 2006 to 2009, apparently still buddies with Nick Saban, uh, kind of looks at him as a mentor and whatnot. Fun fact, Eric Andrews has been hot and cold, hot and cold for years now, uh, coming off a win against Jamie Pickett March 2nd. Pretty good competition to win against. 
Uh, Chris Weidman, meanwhile, his last fight was an egregious eye poke and very controversial decision win over Bruno Silva. So that kind of sours things a little bit because before that he had been out of commission for, okay, not as long as I thought. Since 2023, he had a fight against Brad Tavares, lost, but then didn't fight at all in 2022, knocked out in 2021 by Uriah Hall. I'm, I'm going to Andrews on this. I think Andrews – just has he's just a little bit younger, not enough to really move the needle for me. Thirty-seven compared to Weidman's forty. Uh, surprisingly less reach, three three inch reach disadvantage. But I mean, Weidman's primarily a wrestler. He's not really a power in his hands striker. Whereas Andrews is going to be the guy who primarily wants to stand up and strike with you and try to get the knockout, try to hunt for a finish that way. Uh, the only time that didn't really work out too well for him, and he just got absolutely picked apart, and the striking was against Khalil Roundtree in 2019. Other than that, he usually at least is able to have a puncher's chance against most people or at least pack enough power to kind of make you reconsider your choices uh, in there against him. So I'm going to go Andrews' money line on this. I don't really feel confident in a finish. It's only three rounds. Both guys would probably honestly kind of be a little bit sloppy, a little bit disgusting to kind of look at here. But, I mean, if you go Andrews by decision, though, plus 185, I'm going to go that, actually. Andrews by decision at plus 185, since you're getting that at a pretty decent uh, plus line to kind of balance out how he's minus 118 money, Weidman's minus 102. I'm going Andrews decision on that. But it's tough. I can see why you're in on Weidman. I don't blame anybody for Mm -hmm. Weidman. Uh, it's probably the most competitive fight on a very uh, uncompetitive card for the most part with very uh, matchups that have high disparity. Let's just say that. This is one of the closest ones on there, but Andrew's decision for me. All right. I respect it, man. Uh, this next fight, we talked about him a little bit on the Tuesday Live. That's your guy, Marcus. Why don't you break down his fight? Jonathan Martinez versus Marcus McGee. Yeah, this is a great fight. This is one of my most anticipated fights on the whole card. Uh, both guys really promising bantamweight fighters here in this division. Martinez, 19-5, and five, lost to Jose Aldo this past May. No shame there. Jose is like the ageless wonder. His game is just aging like a fine wine. Still able to be competitive with all the wear and tear and age that he has as an example of how that doesn't negatively impact you. Jose is always a live dog in pretty much any fight he's had in the past few years since going down to bantamweight. He's actually had... Tremendous amount of success that you just were not expecting from a guy with, you know, his uh, record and history and everything else. Uh, Other than that, that was his only blemish. I mean, the guy is like pretty much – I also forget how long he's been in the UFC, actually. He's been in the UFC since 2018. I feel like for some reason it was only 2020. No, he's 2018. Lost his debut to Sukumthoth. That was kind of bad, you know, seeing how Sukumthoth panned out. Two fight win streak, lost. Two fight win streak, lost. Two fight, three, four, five, six, six fights until he met Jose Aldo. Uh, six fight win streak. So Aldo snapped that. Pretty good names on that six fighter. Uh, Vince Morales, Cub Swanson, Saeed Nurmagomedov, and Adrian Yanez. Uh, Adrian Yanez one was nasty, that leg kick finish in round two. I was in on Yanez when we covered that fight. I'm also a big Yanez guy. He just made Yanez look bad, just terrible. But Marcus McGee, I'm a big Marcus McGee guy. He's not got the experience edge. Nine and one is his record. So Martinez definitely has the experience with 19 and five being his record. And he's 34, which for bantamweight is getting a little bit. Uh, up there in age for a prospect, but I mean, he has no wear and tear. He doesn't have the damage and everything else. He's basically like a new car at this point with no dents, no dings. Uh, 5'8, 69 inch reach. Martinez, 69 and a half, a little bit of a reach discrepancy. But what I like about McGee in this fight is we just talked about Gaston Bolognos. We just saw how good he was just last week. He made Bolognos look like nothing. Round two, TKO. JP buys right hook finish, rear naked over Journey Newsom. Like the guy has got finishing power that definitely translates to the UFC. All three UFC fights by finish. Nobody's made out of round two with them yet. I think this fight ends in a finish. Uh, 
Marcus McGee, another thing I like about him, he's training out of the MMA lab in Arizona. It's one of the premier gyms in MMA right now. John Crouch, Benson Henderson, Joe Irvin are the owners. Sean O'Malley's been at that gym quite a bit. He's trained there. So great partner to train with. A uh, lot of names there. TJ Dillashaw's done a little bit of training there with Dwayne Ludwig. It's, it's a phenomenal gym. It really is an underrated one that people should be talking about when they talk about, you know, the uh, – Jackson Winks, the Tri Stars, the American Top Teams, the AKAs. I think MMA Lab should be up there also. So Marcus McGee's just phenomenal. His striking's just so crisp. He has such violence of action with every movement. He even has, like I said, that grappling finish over Journey Newsom. He hasn't had to showcase that uh, too much since then because everybody's usually not able to withstand the barrage that's coming from his powers, his po- uh, his punch. His punches, excuse me, his punches are precise, they're powerful, they're accurate. So I'm going to be on Marcus McGee for this. And looking at the lines here, how do I see it playing out? Primarily striking, every fight starts standing. I think he's going to take that opportunity unless, you know, Martinez gives him something to work with. So looking at double methods here potentially because somebody's getting finished. I just think that McGee's going to be the one doing the finishing. If you go McGee by KO, TKO, or sub, it's plus 180. So, yeah, I'm going to take that. I I would be shocked if either guy makes it to decision. So, McGee, KO, TKO, or sub at plus 180 is how I'm rolling to offset the money line because the money line is still good because Marcus McGee is a minus 148. Martinez is a plus 124. So, people are still kind of sleeping on this right now, and I think those are very fair odds to be getting McGee at. This is where you got to capitalize and you got to lock that in now because I think the closer we get to Saturday, people are going to kind of wake up and like have watched some tape on McGee and kind of reconsider some some poor choices they made. What do you think? Yeah, I think that we called that Bologna's fight last week at plus 185. I called him to get the outright win, and he did. Um, I, I agree with you a lot. I think McGee definitely has more power than Martinez does. Martinez seems like he's more of – um like a point fighter or uh, 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 like a guy that gets his KOs just by volume. Um, right. I think McGee can catch him. Looking at the splits over at Vegas, 68% of the bets are on Marcus McGee, 69% of the money at the minus 155. So that would point to Vegas being on the side of Martinez. I just don't know if it's enough to get me over there. I also don't know if there's a finish because – I think Martinez might be able to just outlast and not get, because I don't think that these, there's going to be a sub in this fight. I think it's probably going to be a KO or decision. So I'm just going to take McGee on the money line here just to play it safe. Looking at his stats, I mean, he's better everywhere except for takedown accuracy by 2%. Look at strike defense, Martinez 57, McGee 71%, while McGee throws more punches and is more accurate. Just seems like McGee's decided to be on here. I agree. How about this next fight? Let's talk about Mauricio Huffy versus James Lontop. We just talked about James Lontop not too long ago. I forgot who he was fighting, but we were just discussing him. Um, I believe we probably picked against him, and I think we're both probably picking against him again here. Uh, Mauricio Huffy, man, the fighting nerds, every t- pretty much every chance you can get to pick one of those guys, you got to pick them, guys and gals, I should say. Uh, the Fighting Nerds, one of the best, one of the best fight teams right now in the world. Minus nine hundred favorite. That's insane. Um, look at the money. Six percent of bets on Lon Top. Nineteen percent of money. They're just chasing that plus six hundred. Um, like I, I get it. You're chasing the number, but I feel like those are just donations. Like I just don't see it. Ninety four percent of bets. Eighty one percent of the uh, money on. Huffy at the minus 900. So you're going to have to go something here. I'm probably going to go Huffy by the KO is what I'm thinking. Huffy by KO is minus 150. So, I mean, you're, you're getting it down to just a single single method, and you're still getting minus points. Then you get the decision at plus 200 for Huffy, and then submission plus 800. Double chance if you're thinking like KO subs minus 175. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you're probably you're looking at KO decision, but that's only minus 750. So I feel like, you know what, just take the KO. 
Or if you really want to take the decision, if you think that Lontop can last, I don't think so. I think he's probably going to get finished here. I will take the Huffy KO. What do you think, Bobby? Riding 100% with you. Just to add a little bit of context before we move on, you've already hit, hit it pretty good. Uh, Huffy, second UFC fight. We don't have much to go off of other than he just absolutely dismantled Jamie Malarkey in round one like nothing from strikes this past May. Standing scissor sweep, like such an unconventional move that you just have to be feeling yourself and just have that confidence to just go in there and know that you're so much better than that guy to just be able to hit that in an actual fight on somebody and not just, you know, in, in the training room. And Malarkey's a guy who is tough as nails, and he's usually only put out by volume. And, I mean, I know Hack Ferrass managed to get around one right before that in December 2023, but – Maybe his chin's cracked. Maybe he's not. Maybe it's not. But it's still crazy that, you know, like Malarkey's a guy granite chin, and the guy was just put out like it was nothing. Usually it takes a few shots before you can get Malarkey out of there, and Huffy definitely lives up to his nickname of one shot. Uh, another guy coming out of the Fighting Nerds. We've talked about the Fighting Nerds gym on this on this channel numerous times. Cal Barallo, uh, you got Huffy. Brawl I forget the female fighter they have, and then John Silva, looking like a phenomenal team, like the next hot thing that's coming out up there with the MMA labs and all those other gyms we just got done talking about. So, yeah, you pretty much described everything. Huffy just seems like that guy right now that until further notice, he's pretty much going to just steamroll through here like the rest of his fighting nerds companions, and it's going to be interesting to see who, if anybody's going to be able to stand up to him right now. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Bobby, why don't you take one of my currently favorite guys on the roster? Bo Nickel versus Paul Craig. Very interesting fight here because Bo Nichols obviously is every fight he's ever been in. A very heavy favorite, minus 1,350 right now. Paul Craig plus 800, and that's just on the money line alone. I was going to try to be cheeky on this fight until I saw that apparently Vegas has the script too, and they think it's going to happen this way as well. <laughs> Bone Nickel KO TKO is at a minus 150. You get better odds on a sub at plus 180 or a decision at plus 750. I guess they got the script. So I think Bone Nickel KO TKO because Paul Craig is so terrible on the feet. He really his best chance is to grapple with Bo Nickel and get that like last second Hell Mary like he did up against Magomed Ankalaev a few years ago. That is the only avenue for Paul Craig to win. So as long as Bo Nickel wants to keep this standing, it's gonna benefit him in that he showcases, okay, this would be my second KO TKO in the UFC. People can stop saying I don't have hands now. And he's denying Paul Craig his only opportunity to win this fight. So I mean, it sucks, but I guess I'll still just go with that because I am seriously just that confident that he's going to be able to KO, TKO, or just outright knock out Paul Craig. But there's not really much to say about this fight. Yes, Paul Craig is a meme of a fighter, and he did have that last second uh, win over Ankalaya. But other than that, it really was just like the luckiest moment. He should have bought a lottery ticket and just retired and rode off into the sunset after that because he's just done nothing really special since then. Like KO'd by Cal Barallo in his last fight this past May. Rear naked choked by Brendan Allen uh, last November. Uh, there was one fight we called for him that he actually won. I want to say maybe that was the Krylov fight. I think it was the Krylov fight we covered. No, I don't even remember. But we've covered Paul Craig a few times on this show. And in his last five fights, he's one and four. And he's been finished in three of those. So... Not inspiring much confidence. Andre Muniz, he managed to beat Krylov, as I mentioned. Mauricio Hua, not to be conv confused with Huffy, Mauricio Shogun Hua, well past his prime when they fought in 2020. I'm not surprised he beat Shogun. And then you have pretty much just a bunch of other random people. Good thing he beat Kennedy and Chokwu, else I'd really have no confidence in him. But <laughs> he's a known commodity. He's been in the UFC now since 2016 since December, had a lot of fights, been finished a lot, 17 wins, eight losses. 
we, we just know what we're getting here. There's no questions. There's no mystery box. It's a pretty known thing. He's going to get finished for the third time, unfortunately, uh, consecutively. Probably looking at retirement, looking at getting cut, something of that nature. It's brutal, but it's the fight game. It's how it goes. Not much else to say. It's just kind of a waste. It's almost a foregone conclusion, but I'll say Bo Nickel by KOTKL at minus 150. It's not helping anything, but it'll help my conscience just to be right. What do you think? I think you're going to like what I what I have to say here. Um, you know, I was looking at Bo Nickel on Tuesday, and it, it was just too much for me to take. He was minus 900. Well, then he moved to minus 1,200 when I was making these graphics for the show. Now he's almost minus 1,400. <laughs> like, he just, he's just keeps going, man. Like, this dude is, like, an all-time all all time favorite in the UFC. He already holds the record for being the highest betting favorite in UFC history, and we're seeing him trend that way again. Like, this guy is always a minus 1,000-something. It's just insane. Um, it is. So, so we don't get any value. And this is the most interesting part. Bobby, you think uh, like a ton of money's flooding in on Bo Nickel, don't you? I would think. I would hope. Bobby, 53% of the money is on Paul Craig. That is insane. <laughs> that is insane. It's just people chasing that number. They're just chasing the plus eight. It is. It is. Plus 800. So you think Vegas is going to pay out more than half the pot at plus 800? Like, that just that just makes me feel so much better about Bo Nickel. Like, okay, right. oh, a ton of sharp money's pouring in on Paul. That's just a bunch of people thinking you know, he did it to Ankalaya if he can do it to Bo Nickel. Right. And it's been it's, years since he even did that against Ankalaya. Yes. Yes. It's like, stop, man. It's... Vegas is not paying that out. There's just no, no. way. There's no. no like that is like miracle on ice that we're talking about. Like yeah. all time upset. And it's it's not even like like obviously Bo Nickel should win this fight and like he should be a heavy favorite, but Vegas is not going to pay that. Like just like fight aside, player A versus player B, Vegas is never ever going to pay that out. No. Not so, even close. No. So it's Bo Nickel here. It does worry me a little bit if, like, do you think he tries to flex his muscles a little bit, like sub the sub guy, sub the BJJ guy? I mean, he could, he could, but you're still just not even getting a good odd on, you're not getting good odds on that either. So it's just all a wash because that's only a plus 180. The only way you're making a little bit of your money back or whatever or profiting as if it goes to decision at plus 750, and I just don't think it will. I don't either. I don't either. I really want the KO sub because I think that is, like, a very, very good bet, but it's at minus 575. Just, like, holy right. hell, man. Like, well, let's see. At that, like, he's one of the biggest favorites on the card with that. Like, he would just trail only John Jones and Huffy. If you take like the, the only game. way you're making a little bit is if you think Paul Craig lives to make it to round two and he gets the KO TKO <laughs> in round two. And that's now suddenly plus 400, which maybe I don't know, but God, dude, Paul Craig looks bad. I don't know if Bo nickel has power. I mean, obviously he rocked the hell out of Woodburn, mm -hmm. but I don't know if he's got the type of, I don't know. I was it's, hearing it's, that. Like, if he's going to display his, like, boxing, like, this is the match to do it. Like, take advantage of a vulnerable Paul Craig. And then at the same time, like, if he doesn't want to engage in grappling, like, if he does get the takedown, just make Craig just shell up and then just ground and pound him. Just yeah. stay on his back. Don't try to flatten him out or anything. Just stand there and hammer fist the crap out of him. I, I, I guess I'll go the KO with you. I'm just a little worried that... He gets the sub. He gets a little cheeky. But, yeah. Uh, uh, God, I hate that it's still at minus number for a single method. Yeah, but. you're not. Vegas knows what's up. They're not letting you make your money on this. No. Nope. Okay. I'll go with you with the Bo Nickel KO minus 150. There we go. Beautiful. Let's talk about another. Like, these last three fights are excellent. That is Charles Oliveira versus Michael Chandler. Bobby, this is a great fight. 
I mean, yes. Michael Chandler hasn't fought in so long, and Oliveira almost beat my boy Armin Sarukian. I I have to go Oliveira here, and looking at the money, again, like I, I hate that I'm on a lot of public bets here. Sixty six percent of the bets, fifty seven percent of the money at minus two sixty five. So maybe that lean is that like Vegas is more on the Oliveira side and on the side of the public because they don't want to pay out. The forty three percent at two to one odds for the two fifteen for Chandler. I, I I think I'm gonna go Oliver here, and I don't know if that number's enough to get me to go to like a method Chandler. He might have an early barrage, but for Oliver, I feel like the subs just gonna be there. But then again, like Chandler's a good wrestler. Uh I mean, That's the thing that sucks is you're not getting good odds on. If you do double KOTKO or sub for Charles, it's minus 200. If you only right. do single, you're still getting screwed on that. The only, well, if you do Oliveira KOTKO, that's going to be your best chance because that's at plus 215 right now. But I feel like it's a sub, is what I'm leaning to. I mean, he did finish him by strikes in the first match. So, yeah. There's round two strikes that he finished Chandler in. When they first met, so you know what? I'm just gonna go Oliver money line. I hate that number, but I would rather just play it extra safe. Wow, this is a five round fight too. Yeah, oh, that does change things then. Hmm. Ah, fudge. Okay, I will go. That five round fights. That five rounds did change things because Michael Chandler after being gone for so long and now he's going to be in for five rounds. Ooh, but right. in all of areas had really good competition. Right. Like he I'll barely t- lost to Saruki yeah. and it's like Chandler's been off and he only has two wins in the UFC. One of those is against Dan Hooker and the other is against Tony Ferguson. He's lost to everybody else. Right. Okay. I'll take Oliveira KO sub at minus 200. Still nasty. Still nasty, but I just don't see it going to decision, but I really don't want to pick between those two. The biggest X factor in this, to me, is we know that the last time that Michael Chandler fought was November 2022 when uh, he got rear naked choked out by Dustin Poirier, and he was just waiting for McGregor ever since then when they were supposed to fight this past June. You know, I'd been calling it on social media for weeks and months that it was never going to happen. And I had the exclusive in-depth interviews and behind-the-scenes access to Conor McGregor throughout that whole ordeal. If you were following me on Twitter, I was like the best source of news on that before anybody else who's supposed to be a finger quotations expert analysis, uh, expert analyst, and all that made-up bullshit. So anyway, so does that two-year break – give Chandler time to recover because he's only been in the UFC a short amount of time and he's taken a lot of punishment. He made his debut, as I mentioned, against Dan Hooker, January 2021, strikes finish round one, lost to Oliveira, strikes round two in May of 2021. November 2021, lost to Gaethje. May 2022, head kicked, uh, KO'd Tony Ferguson, lost to Dustin Poirier, rear naked round three, November 2022. He's taken. He's had a lot of fights in a short amount of time and been finished in two of those fights and got pretty dismantled by Gaethje in the other one. And it's like, it usually is a good thing when you're 38 years old uh, to be able to take some time off and to be able to let your chin and your brain and everything get healthy and recover. But I just don't think at this point in his career it's enough. I mean, don't get me wrong. Charles Oliveira is also a guy who has a lot of wear and tear, has a lot of miles. He's been in the game for a long time, 34 fights, uh, 10 losses, one no contest, Chandler 23-8. and eight. So I'm not saying Oliveira is a spring chicken by any means himself. And he is 35, so not a huge age disparity there. But – I think I've got to be with you on Oliveira because Michael Chandler is damn sure an exciting fighter, but for how exciting he is, that leads to him getting finished. And I think he's just another classic case of we finally saw him in the UFC too late. I think it's just another Ben Askren. I think it's just another uh, 
Ben Askren's the one that sticks out to me the most. That just by the time he got to the UFC, there was just nothing left. And I, I suspect the same is potentially, unfortunately, true of Chandler. I mean, don't get me wrong. Before everybody's freaking out in the comments, Chandler has put on far more entertaining and competitive fights than Ben Askren ever did in the in the UFC. But nonetheless, it's still the same principle of it sucks that we didn't get to see these these guys in their primes in the UFC. And instead we're just getting kind of like the twilight stages of their career. So I'm going with you with Oliveira, same method, all that. I just, like you also mentioned, this was a very great uh, piece of insight that you gave. He's fought the better competition. Like Sarukian's looking amazing, looking like he's next in line for that title shot. And he barely lost to Sarukian. Meanwhile, Chandler's like fighting for his life against everybody. And once again, great competition. Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Charles Oliveira, like great, great names, great competition, but he, he lost to them. And even this late in his career, Oliveira is extremely competitive with a guy way younger, way hungrier than him. So, you know, um, why Chandler and Ben Askren remind you so much of each other? Was up? Both wrestled at Mizzou. Yeah, both Mizzou wrestlers, along with Tyron Woodley. So yep. you're starting to see a trend here. <laughs> Tyron <laughs> Woodley God. really went off a cliff fast. Ben Askren went off a cliff fast. Michael Chandler going off a cliff? Maybe. His kids in the backseat. Dad, get your ass back on the road. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, see you at the top, son. Goes off the fucking cliff. <laughs> Shout out to Guru for that one. Uh, let's talk about this last fight, man. This is, speaking of Guru, his boy John Jones versus Steve Miocic. Bobby, take it away, man. We didn't think this fight was ever going to happen. It shouldn't be happening because this should 1,000% be Tom Aspinall versus John Jones. Don't know how we have a fight right now with an interim champion and he doesn't get to fight the reigning champion. If you're watching this far, there's a message out there for somebody. Hey, pussy, you still there? <laughs> John Jones versus Stipe Miocic. <laughs> John, Jones is, <laughs> John Jones is a minus 625. Stipe is a plus 455. I've been saying on social media that he had pretty much retired. Stipe was done. It was over with for Stipe. It should be over with for Stipe, 100%. It should be over with. Stipe just two weeks ago was still doing 24 hour shifts at the firehouse. You know, his full time job that he retired from the UFC to go do his full time job of being a firefighter. And that's just more evidence that this is not somebody who's coming back for a love of the fighting game, for some competitive spirit, for anything like that. No, this is a guy who was offered. I would hope a substantial amount of money in the millions to be able to go out there and to be able to fight again, simply because of the money. I'm hoping it's in the millions and I'm hoping they make it worth his while because he's not been wanting to fight. He's been retired. There was a whole YouTube video I posted on Twitter of him being sworn in full time shortly after the Francis Ngannou loss in March, 2021, where he got knocked out of him being sworn in full time. And he was literally quoted as saying, well, after the UFC, I needed to do something because I'm too young to fully commit to, you know, just living out the 65 and drawing the pension life. So I figured I might as well make this my new career, like verbatim words out of his mouth. I needed a new career. <laughs> and so John Jones comes along and rambles on about legacy and rambles on about wanting to fight a legend and all this stuff that let's face it, MMA moves fast. Fans are fickle and as evidenced by how angry a lot of people, especially new viewers that only started watching in like the last two, three, or maybe even four years because there's a lot of COVID viewers. Nobody really thinks of Stipe like that anymore because their main memory of Stipe is that Francis Ngannou KO of getting knocked out. They might have a little bit of a memory of John Jones from the Cyril Gon fight last year in March. In the lead up to that, they probably went back and looked at, you know, why is this guy only got one loss? Why was that one loss very controversial? Why is he having no contest? Like they probably know the story about the two fights with Daniel Cormier, the hitting the pregnant woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The arrest, everything about John Jones that we already know that I'm not going to waste time talking about. 
But it's like people don't really think most fans nowadays that started watching in the last few years, and there's a huge amount of them, nobody's really like, oh, man, if he beats Stipe Miocic, he's cemented. This is the legacy-defining fight for him. It's just like why do we have an interim belt holder in Aspinall and the division's being held up and he's going to be like the longest reigning interim belt holder in like the UFC history because John just – is saying that he doesn't want to fight him. And you can act like that's trolling. A lot of people are like, oh, he's just joking. You know, he'll really fight. No, I don't know. I'm not best friends with John Jones. I don't talk to him every day. We don't go get brunch together. And he's not hitting my lineup saying, oh, uh, oh, you know, Bobby, I'm just trolling. You know, I'll fight Aspinall if it comes to it and everything. No, what I'm hearing is what everybody else is hearing. So unless you're somebody that has that type of access to John Jones, kudos to you if you do out there, golf clap. But the vast majority is, oh, I want to fight Alex Pereira. Uh, if I if I beat Stipe, when I beat Stipe, I'm one of, I want to fight Alex Pereira for the BMF belt. That's what Bobby's here, and that's what he's telling Bobby. So whatever he's telling you, go for it. But I, Stipe should have stayed retired. I'm, I'm dying after this fight's over to know after pay-per-view sales and all that are calculated what the final purses end up being because if it's less than $2 million, I don't know what Stipe's risking his life out there for to get to ruin his own legacy. Talk about legacy. He's definitely ruining his by taking this fight because, once again, it's kind of like the Bo Nickel. It seems like a foregone conclusion at this point. You have a guy coming out of retirement that hasn't fought in three years, and everybody's like, look at these pictures of this beautiful lighting and how in shape he is. I'm not saying he's out there at the firehouse eating all the chili and burgers and just hanging out. He probably is in good shape and he probably still does, you know, tumble around in the gym a little bit and kind of screw around with the heavy bag. But once again, John Jones for all of his faults and all of his problems. And even though he was very inactive between barely beating Dominic Reyes in 2020, February of 2020, almost a full three years off before he fought Cyril gone when he came back and moved up to heavyweight, like long periods of inactivity, but at least I buy the excuse. He was properly putting on the weight for the move to heavyweight. He was working out like this is a guy who takes his strength and conditioning serious known power lifter with like masthetics back in the day. If you're a power lifter or a bodybuilder or whatever, like I was back in the day, you know masthetics, you know Garrett Gonzalez and Simon Otero and the gym they had there in New Mexico. This is a guy that for all of his faults is very methodical and very neurotic about his preparation, his training, keeping himself in shape, ready to go, will not take fights that he does not think he can win to the point where like now we're right back to, oh, he's ducking, he's ducking, but – it, it's still smart. As much as I dislike John Jones, the human being, I have to respect how intelligent and calculated he is as an athlete and a fighter because he doesn't take fights to the extreme. Like every fighter thinks they can win every fight they're in, but there's also a lot of fighters out there and you know that they're taking fights just to get paid or just to get notoriety or whatever. No, John is obsessed He's obsessed with remaining in his eyes unbeaten because he doesn't count the Mark Hamill disqualification as a real loss. He doesn't count the no contest against Daniel Cormier as a real loss. He's obsessed with, in his mind, being unbeaten, continuing this streak, continuing this legacy, and he would not have been carefully choosing and handpicking, cherry-picking this fight if he had any doubt in his mind that he could win. And it's just... A shame because once again, I'll say it one last time. I really hope the money's worthwhile for Stipe to be doing this to himself and doing this to his legacy and all the toxic sludge that's going to get spilled his way on social media when he inevitably loses this match because it's it's just stupid. It's just a stupid fight that just shouldn't be happening, but he gets what he wants because he's John Jones. Dana loves him. We already know why and how Dana loves him. And Dana just constantly takes every opportunity, even when it's not relevant to glaze the man. (laughs) But John's going to win what he does from there. Who knows? Because there's no sense in arguing about it. There's no sense in crying about it. He's demonstrated time and time again, 
with his legal troubles and everything that's happened that he's pretty much untouchable in the eyes of the UFC. And as long as he remains the draw that he unfortunately is consistently selling between 400,000 to 700, 800,000, I think on the high end numbers of pay-per-views, not McGregor territory, but still respectable, especially in this day and age of declining pay-per-view sales, John Jones is going to get whatever he wants. And if that's Alex Pereira, then it's Alex Pereira. If it's, you know, a Jake Paul stupid freak fight and he beats up Mike Tyson next to get it. So you're just not getting good odds on this. My 625 John Jones money line plus 455 steep A money line. Everybody knows what's going to happen. Uh, as far as like methods, you get a little bit on methods. I don't think it's going to go to decision. It's going to be five rounds. He's probably going to sub or KO steep A. It's pick your poison. Stipe is not the best grappler in the world. He got a little bit better when, uh, with his fights with Daniel Cormier because he had to concentrate so heavily on preparing for the wrestling and the grappling. But, I mean, we also saw in that uh, Francis rematch where he got knocked out that Francis had prepared his grappling to the extent that it gave Stipe trouble. And with how powerful and big he is, I think John Jones is just as powerful and just as big once again, especially with that powerlifting background and the absurd totals he was able to put up in um, powerlifting meets as a complete novice to the sport and everything. After his first or second God, I can't even keep track of the suspensions. He's had so many, but around 2015 when he was serving a suspension and got into that, let's just say John Jones is a pretty strong Physically impressive guy, even if he doesn't physically look the same as Francis Ngannou. There's definitely some power there, and there's some strength generated in his punches and in his grappling. And I think he pretty much can do whatever he wants. If he wants to grapple with Stipe, he's going to be able to cut through Stipe. If he wants to stand and trade with Stipe, he's going to destroy Stipe. So your best bet, and you're probably still not even going to get good lines on this, yeah, KOTK or sub-double method for John Jones is minus 250. You're – you just, I don't know, maybe for like Haymaker, I'll pick something, but you're just not getting anything good. What do you think? It's fine that he's fighting Stipe, but this is this is one of my big issues. Go ahead and fight Stipe, but you're no longer the champ. You have to vacate right. the belt to fight Stipe. That's, that's how I feel because, like, Chael had a good point. He's like, as soon as the champion fights, there is no interim champion because the champion's back, the champion's fighting. Why You can't have two champions in the same division. So, like, you can't take that from um, from Aspinall. And even at the same time, it's like, okay, no, Aspinall can remain the interim champion. Jones can stay the champion. It's like, wh- why are we having this fight? Why do we have right. an interim? This, this whole conundrum is just, like, really, really frustrating to me. And I hate that Jones is getting away with it. And it's like, yeah. out of all the people, like, he is so not deserving to. Exactly. Yeah. This uh, this is your go. Right. <laughs> I just read that they're going back to the old gloves now. And the day before that, I saw an article that John Jones tried on the new gloves. And it's just very suspicious that he tried on the new gloves and was like, I hate these. And then a day later, we're like, oh, we're going back to the old gloves permanently now. Huh. Huh. I wonder why. One is man has that much power. I heard that it's just because they didn't get it passed by the like New York Commission. I don't know. I thought I saw something that said permanently. If you have anything in the comments, chime in otherwise. But let me check it again right quick. Let me try to find it about the old gloves. Yeah, Dana White confirms. This is from Aaron Bronstetter two hours ago. Dana White confirms UFC will permanently be going back to the old gloves. So, yeah, permanently going back. Why, So. Man. Could it be other things? People are speculating. Yeah, most other fighters didn't like them. They think, you know, obviously we had the debate, are knockouts reduced with the new gloves? Because when they first introduced them, it was like something insane, like 15 fights or something stupid before a knockout was finally (coughs) secured in those gloves. I don't know. I just think it's pretty ironic that yesterday I'm reading about John Jones, tried them on, hated them literally a day later suddenly we're just completely done with them and we're permanently back to the old ones it's just kind of funny that 
No, that's a good point. I didn't know that. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I'm going to be on the same thing. John Jones, the KO sub at the minus 250. Um, interesting numbers here real quick before we get to the haymaker too. John Jones versus Stipe, the over-under set at 2.5. You can get the over at the plus 105. I don't think Jones wants to go out there and cream Stipe. I really don't. I think he wants to make it look like this is a competitive match that Stipe still got it. Because if he just goes out there and just crushes like a, a great past his prime, then like everybody's going to just clown on him more. And he is so about, like, he cares so much about the public appearance. So I think he's going to let this go a little bit instead of just creaming him. And so, you know, the over two and a half also, I just think guys have lasted in the cage. Like I, I know, you know, two people go into the cage, one person comes out, that's John Jones. It's like, okay, but I feel like people have had success staying in the cage and staying competitive with John. So I think I like that over there at the over two and a half at plus one Oh five. All right, Bobby, the people might not know this, but right now, if they place a $5 bet over on DraftKings, they can get $200 in free bets. All they have to do is use the link at the description of this video or head to our website, bettergreen.com. That's B E T T O R green.com. $5 bet gets you $200 in free bets. And we try to give you guys a big plus odd bet every week. Throw it in, throw your five dollars on it. Hopefully, you win, get a good payout back, and then you still have the two hundred dollars in free bets. So, Bobby, what is your haymaker this week? That one's tough because this card is just chock full of crap that you're just really not getting good odds on, mm -hmm. and a lot of mismatches for the most part, except for the few gems that we've kind of mentioned here. So, all in all, wow, uh, interesting. I'm so confident on Basil Hafez, and you're getting pretty much anything you want with that guy at a pretty good line. You're getting a KO, TKO from him at plus 1,100. You're getting a sub from him at plus 800. You're getting a decision at plus 5. The way Val Woodburn was lighting that man up on the feet, though, I don't remember much about Hafez's striking. Like I said, the JDM fight, his grappling just strike, uh, sticks out in my mind so much there. But what about... What if I'm gonna say I'm gonna say my haymaker is gonna be Hafez KO TKO at plus eleven hundred. I just okay. don't like how Oban was getting lit up by Val, by Val Woodburn on the feet. Like Val Woodburn was kind of dangerously close, if my memory serves me correct, of knocking out Oban Elliott or at least getting the TKO. So Hafez KO TKO plus 1100 that's the purpose of a haymaker right we're gonna go with that so yeah plus 1100 ko tko for hafez i guess okay i like it man i like it make sure you guys get those bets in before the action on saturday also if you haven't yet the jake paul mike tyson fight is this week also i'll link it at the end of this video make sure you guys check that out me and bobby do a quick breakdown of that fight we do break down every ufc card throughout the year and we will see you guys in the next episode peace guys Peace.